all the books. It, it, it's time for book reviews. Hello everyone and welcome to Forkmaster's blog for the warm of the Files and Gaming System, created by Games Workshop based in the UK. And welcome to book review number 124. Today I'm reviewing the novel called Praetorian of Dorn, written by John French. And we can begin to talk about the front cover for this novel. So when this was released, I got so freaking hyped and pumped. We got Imperial Fist vs Alpha Legion. With a cover that shows that the legendary duel between Alpharius and Rogal Dorn. In the background we see a boarding action of Imperial Fist as they fight off the Alpha Legion. The details are amazing, all from the colors to the details of the armor, the ship they are on, the planets and the space in the window. And it doesn't feel too busy like for instance No No Fear did. The main focus is on the Primarchs and that is where the focus should be. I would give this front cover 10 out of 10 forks. Let's see what this story is all about. Recalled from the Great Crusade after Ulanor, Rogal Dorn and the 7th Legion were appointed as the Emperor's Praetorians, but only after the War Master's treachery was revealed did the full extent of that secret duty become apparent. Now the solar system comes under attack for the first time since the war began, and many of the seemingly impregnable defenses wrought by the Imperial Fist proved inadequate. With the eyes fixed firmly upon this new threat beyond the gates of Terra, who in turn will protect Dorn from the enemy within. So after having written the short story The Last Remembrancer, the novella The Crimson Fist and the audio drama Templar, they finally culminating into the novel about the Imperial Fist. I should issue right away, this novel covers some deep in spoilers, so continue to look at this video at your own risk. So this novel has a clash of themes and oppositional ways of how to conduct war. Rogal Dorn being the stoic, always fighting with open cards and fear fighting, with Alpharius hiding in the shadows, it creates a great outset. Which of these are the better or more honorable ways to fight? But the problem I see here is that this ephematical arts of war isn't developed or explored in too deep of a nature, which disappointed me. First of all, the Imperial Fist as a whole doesn't get a lot of screen time. We won't get to explore their culture, their views upon the galaxy as a whole. Rogal Dorn even takes a back seat in the, the first proper novel about him and his legion. It reminds me of the joke from Monty Python, Sir not appearing in this movie. That would describe Rogal Dorn and many of the other Imperial Fists very well here. Instead we follow the character of Arch Amos, or Arch Amos, or Arch Amos, a native born on Inuit and a part of the first inducted Imperial Fist recruits. Due to this, he is also part of the first, and the sad story is that he is the last of the first recruits by the time of this novel. He would later rise in the ranks to be the leader of Dorn's Huskals, his own personal bodyguard. Told through stages of flashbacks, he was born with the original name of Kai and would befriend the actual Archamus and Jonad, a character we saw more closely in The, the Crimson Fist. Due to an error made in the training stages as neophytes, the original Archamus was killed in an accident and when given the chance to be inducted into the Legionis Astartes, he would adopt the name of Archamus to honor his dead friend. Someone described Archamus as the ideal fist through and through, and the same person felt it was a good opportunity to see Dorn from an outside perspective just like Abaddon is seen in the Black Legion series. I think this is a grand failure as our, our Seamus doesn't come across as an interesting character in the way that he is written and Dorn isn't shown in his perspective. As I said, Dorn is in this story very little. So this story opens up roughly at the same time period as The Path of Heaven written by Chris Wraith. The heresy has been going on for about 5 years. As seen in the hands of the Emperor written by Rob Sanders, Rogal Dorn has spent the be better half of a decade preparing for the Imperial Palace for the eventual coming siege. It is then that the operatives of the Alpha Legion activates legionaries that has been in long time stasis on Terra with the main mission to wreak havoc for a coming invasion. We have a lot of Imperial Fist characters. 
where the dramatis personae makes them far more interesting than the, this actual novel does. Alright, as the image shows, uh, now shows here, they have been divided into split groups with the mission of protecting spheres around the soul system. It is not explained exactly the details of when this was put into place and how it works. Like I at first thought the first sphere was closest to Terra, but then it seems to be the opposite. But considering Sigismund and Rogal Dorn are not on the best of terms at, as of the story The Crimson Fist and Templar, I can understand why he is put further away. Sigismund is explored deeply in the outer drama Templar and, and I was hoping to see more of him now as some time has passed, but just like Rogal Dorn, he is barely not appearing in this story. It's a shame as he was tasked with rooting out word bearers still in the soul system giving him an op golden opportunity to use his skills as he fought them off in the past. Fafnir Ron returns as well from Templar, but also barely in this story. Captain Halbrecht returns as last seen in The Flight of the Eisenstein, written by James Swallow. He's promoted to Lord Castellan and the new fleet master as Jonad is killed in the Crimson Fist, but only known as missing as for Rogal Dorn. Camba Diaz returns after last being seen in Mechanicum, where he is also promoted to Lord Costellan and the Siege Master, most probably after his involvement there. Demetrius Catafalque makes a return after being in the hands of the Emperor Short. Considering he was a part of the clash with the Custodes, I'm surprised that isn't brought up here as well, as a, as a callback to the previous story. Kestros is a new character and Archamus is second in command. The 344th Company is a reference to the Imperial Fists mentioned in Book 3 Extermination, which is strange as that company is, an, is mentioned being a part of the Retribution fleet. So you see a little small mistake there. So this is what I've gathered from Lexicanum. The first sphere is the outermost defensive zone from Neptune to Pluto. It was commanded by Sigismund. The second sphere oversaw the Jupiter region. It was commanded by Halbrecht. The third sphere oversaw the blockade of traitor-occupied Mars. It was commanded by Ifrid. The fourth sphere was commanded by Cam Camba Diaz and oversaw the region between Terra and Mars. And the fifth sphere was Terra and Luna, overseen by Rugal Dorn himself. Those who also knows me knows that continuation is important for me, and I found it strange that the Imperial Fists weren't listed with the appropriate companies they command but all of them are promoted to Lord Castellans, so I can forgive it here. But this then leads into the Alpha Legion part of the story. So, as it is with that Legion, it is not heavily explored about company numbers, only names are present. We see the return of Ingo Peck, the first captain, and Matthias Herzog, the second captain, both who are demoted to just captains without a company number, which I found particularly strange. I think that's just a laziness from French. If you're gonna include them, then have a proper continuation from the novel called Legion. New characters that are appearing in this story is Fokron, who actually appeared previously in the We Are One short story, which I reviewed previously before this. He is a headhunter, so that is a carryover from the Forge World outlet. The last important uh, character in this is Kel Celonius, who at first is presented as a mere headhunter, one of those that, that free Fokron and the rest of their squad, then that we find out that he is in fact Alpharius in disguise, and Alpharius back on the main ship is the real Celonius, who is in fact a Harrow Master and one of the highest ranking officers in the Legion. Celonius and Alpharius used psychic mind tricks to exchange bodies in a sort of sense. It is supposed to be a twist, which was just confusing for me at first to read while I was reading this novel. So following the opening stages where the Alpha Legion runs havoc, they begin to send out terror messages that which alludes to the Night Lords. This is a small callback to the other drama called The Dark King and the Lightning Tower, with the confrontation between Rogal Dorn and Conrad Curse, the Night Hunter. I think it was heavily missed opportunity not to explore this thing further, particularly that of Rogal Dorn's potential fears. The traitors would escape, but not before taunting the Imperial Fist by exploding the statues of the Loyalist Primarchs and pulling off the sheets that covered the traitors. 
This would lead Rogal Dorn to put Arc Amos uh, on an investigation to find out what was happening and where the traitors are currently hiding. Now how the Alpha Legionnaires operate in the field, I would say there are strong representations in this book. During those times it felt like, hell yeah, they, they used codes and protocols, and if they answer the wrong code, they are killed as if they are ne not needed for the mission. There are some confrontations with the tw 20th Legion, along with the trails towards the final battle. I spoke a little of this in the previous book review about the use of flashbacks. They should either mirror the present, but showcase that the change has happened since that flashback, a la arrow type, or they should flesh out the missing part of the puzzle. Now these flashbacks are only here for one purpose, and that is to show Arxamus took another recruit's name in order to honor him. It has very little payoff when another character I barely cared about take his name in a sort of honorific manner to be the new Arxamus, master of the Huskals. The flashbacks are boring and shed very little light on anything and could have been a lot shorter to give more space to other characters, I think. Or they could have built up better the previous encounters with the Alpha Legion. Like what are their previous history with, e with each other like? How was Rogal Dorn's personal relation with Alpharius? The novel leads up to the first battle of the Solar War, which is the Battle of Pluto. The Alpha Legion has set up a base there which is uncovered by the Imperial Fists. This mounts to a large attack and ground assault and space battle. Arxamus leads the defense with a minimum force at first, and when it looks the darkest, he is struck down by Alpharius himself. Rogal Dorn then arrives with a bigger Imperial Fist force and confronts his brother. They engage in a duel, but before this happens they have a discussion with each other, which I think is the stronger part of this whole ideal. The discussion of Alpharius and Dorn about their methods of war, presenting pros and cons to both sides of the conflict. Dorn's honest frontline approach versus Alpharius' secretive and manipulative approach. It all falls down to personal taste in the moral of what you think is right. Some have wrote on a forum that it reminded of Tywin Lannister's question. Explain to me why it is more noble to kill 10,000 men in battle than a dozen at dinner. Spoiler alert! I issue a spoiler alert now, up until the time this stamp for those who doesn't want to be spoiled. So once this spoiler lamp disappears, then it should be safe for you to start looking here once again. Are you ready? Let's go! Now I don't particularly take any side of whom is right here, but I think the different perspectives of Primarchs are better shown in the Lehman Russ novella written by Chris Rafe. Alpharius' master plan isn't that well thought through either. So he set off a certain events with the direct attack on Terra, killing millions, but in the larger picture it is insignificant. He op opens up the investigations that lead Rogal Dorn to Pluto where they meet. They engage in close quarter combat where Rogal Dorn, by nature, is stronger than Alpharius. It ends with Alpharius being brutally slaughtered by Rogal Dorn. What? Yep, he is killed and before you write in the comment section, we can't know for sure that he is dead. Remember that John French has stated on many occasions that this is the case. The evidence also presents itself for it. So now, I have no problem with Alpharius being killed off. I think it's set off that the loyalists should have some victories as well. I also have no problem with Rogal Dorn being the one to do it. Dorn is described as being the bigger of the two, with Alpharius being the smallest Primarch divided into two souls. This has led him to adapt into the sneaky nature that is his personality and the order of his legion. It is how it happens. Alpharius gets cocky and he goes Rogal Dorn in and then is slaughtered. The end. What? I think in the, in the hands of a better offer, it could have been conducted way better. For instance, Dan Abnett would have killed it with this novel's premise. Furthermore, the death of Alpharius is kept hidden for a strange reason, most likely because the lore haven't explicitly stated that he is dead elsewhere, so this is the reason why. But yeah, it's a strange turn that of his character with, with the given personality that he has. 
Now, I was spoiled early on that Alpharius was killed off on a forum, and I really disliked that, so that's why I wanted to avoid this. I then ventured to Electricanum, which hinted at that Alpharius would live on the out inside someone else, so my mind directly sprung to, hmm, perhaps he transferred his consciousness into someone else, truly giving the whole we are one type of ideal. But no, it just meant that Omega took over the persona, making me believe that he was later on killed by Robuti Gilliman, so... So, what did I think about this novel? Well, it didn't focus that much on Rogal Dorn, uh, nor the Imperial Fist in general, uh, giving way too much screen time on the leading character who dies at the end, really being on the nose with the whole You are the Praetorian of Terra, I am your Praetorian. It was really, really bad when he said that. Neither are the Alpha Legion properly explored, which is a really tough shell because we really, on one hand, really want to explore them, but on the same, we want to keep them as a mystery. Do like what Rob Sanders did, where he did both of them. He both explore and keep the mystery. He later on said in an interview, Primarchs are always difficult because they are not really human, not even slightly. Uh, they are ascended beings with powers and flaws that are far beyond what we can really grasp. They have emotions, but these are emotions that can make the heavens shake. Everything is amped up to 11, the good, the bad and everything in between. Yeah, that is really hard to convey and make relatable to a reader. Most often I deal with the challenge of by using space marines or human characters to show us primarchs through their eyes. I rarely go inside a Primarch's head to show you exactly what they are thinking or experiencing. That's why even though there are loads of Primarchs enslaved to darkness, the characters who lead us through the stories are Space Marines. So, this novel, it doesn't continue from previous story threads. It, characters are sidelined and it doesn't even live up to the awesome premise it had at all. But, but it, it isn't offensively bad as previous works from John French uh, has been. Now with all this said, I will give this novel 4 out of 10 forks, and with that I will conclude this book review. Thank you very much for watching this book review, and don't forget to rate and subscribe to my channel. Please give a thumbs up on my videos, and also leave comments if you can do good, so keep, keep on doing them. And leave negative critique if you can do bad, read and improve or remove the content entirely. And also don't forget to share this with your friends, so it could be interesting, entertaining or simply inspiring. And I'm also on Facebook these days, there's a link down in the description, check it out and see if you like it. I try and update more regularly there than I do here on YouTube, not by much but a little to make a difference. But with that said, thank you very much for watching this book review. For the Emperor! Bye!